Communication and Engagement Manager at Inquire, and she's going to be discussing the rights and duties under the educational under under the additional support for learning legislation, including children's rights to additional support for learning. So Kat will uh, present for about 20 minutes and then there will be a, an opportunity to ask Kat any questions you have, either by text or with your mic if you want as well. So Kat's got her. Um, OK, Kat, just over to you. Just before you start, I'd just like to say I've been a, a big fan of Enquire for, for many years and I particularly love all the publications that you do, the flyers that you create. Um, I think they really help to break down the legislation into a, an easy an easy to understand format. So uh, keep keep uh, creating them. They're they're brilliant. Thank you. That's good to hear. Um, can I just check? So I've shared my screen. So can everyone see the um, the first page of my presentation? So, yes, brilliant. That's good to know. So um, yeah, as um, Craig said, I'm the uh, Communications Engagement Manager with Inquire. I'm so pleased to be able to come and do this session. Um, we normally do uh, quite a, a longer session around this, so I've tried to condense it down but still provide meaningful information, but I will probably be going through it at pace. So um, yeah, uh, there's lots and lots of information available that I can point you to. Um, so this isn't just obviously um, everything that's available. So um, just before I start, um, I'm hoping that lots of people here know about Inquire, but for those that don't, we're the Scottish Advice Service for Additional Support for Learning. Um, we've been around since, since 1999, so for a long time. Um, we're funded by the Scottish Government um, and we're funded to provide advice and information um, about additional support for learning to children and young people, parents, carers and professionals um, who support them. Um, our vision as an organisation is to um, uh, is that we hope that all children in Scotland are supported, included, and listened to throughout their education. Um, I'll just check in. Is is my sound and everything all right? If somebody gives me the uh, uh, a thumbs up that everyone's hearing me okay? Yes, sounds great. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so. Um, what what we do is, as I mentioned, we provide advice and information. We do that in a number of ways. We have a helpline which you can get in, or parents and carers can get in contact with through various um, uh, methods. Um, we also provide advice and information um, to professionals as well. So the helpline um, is something that, that, that if you're a professional, you can use as well. If you've got any questions around additional support for learning legislation, rights um, or working with families. Um, we also do lots of outreach sessions like this and um, social media channels are actually hugely important to us. It's a really good way of connecting in with families um, via Facebook tends to be, but we reach a lot of families that way. So lots of information um, being shared as wide as we possibly can. So as I said, we've got our website, which you can see the address there. Um, we, we have, as Craig mentioned, um, our Parents and Carers Guide to Additional Support for Learning, and we have 27 fact sheets on various issues. And I'll talk a little bit about them as I'm going through this presentation. Um, we've got information for professionals. At the moment, it's quite basic information, but we're just putting together some new modules for um, teachers, for um, pupil support staff. So that will be launched in March, and we're really excited about that. Um, and we also have a service for children and young people called REACH, and I'll just point you towards that. Again, that's the um, web address there. If we've got time, I might just talk about that a wee bit, a wee bit more. Um, so what we hope to do is that we help parents and carers feel more listened to and supported and more confident to take action. And by take action, that can just mean working in partnership with the school and um, understanding what the children's needs are and how that they can work with the school really to make sure that children get the support they need. Um, so take action can obviously mean lots of different things for different people. Um, we also help parents and carers um, understand the rights and responsibilities within the additional support for learning legislation, um, know what steps and options are open to them, um, and also importantly, where they can find more information and help if they need it. We get a lot of calls to our helpline that are about education um, on the surface, but actually when we're talking to families through the discussions we have, it becomes clear they maybe need a wee bit of support themselves and we can signpost them to that as well. 
So I'm sure most of you here are um, familiar with additional support needs and what that means. But for those that aren't, it can often just be helpful to go over some basic information about it. So children um, are said to have additional support needs if they need more or different support to what would normally be provided to children their age um, to enable them to get the, the most from their education. And what's really important to know and one of the strengths of the additional support for legislation is that a child doesn't need a diagnosis of a specific disability, condition or impairment to be entitled to that support. Um, additional support needs can be short term or longer term and as you can see from this slide there is obviously lots of different reasons and very broad reasons why children might have um, additional support needs in, uh, with their learning um, and obviously these are not standalone needs so for example some children who may have something that requires longer term input like a sensory impairment may need very specific help uh, relating to that um, uh, needs but for example, if they were being bullied, may need um, support uh, to help them um, cope with that and overcome that experience, but that may just be for a shorter length of time. So needs are certainly not, um, uh, you know, one type of support for a length of time. It's a, a very broad in terms of the definition within the law. And just to point out that carey experienced children are assumed to have additional support needs unless they are assessed as otherwise. So that was changes to the law uh, relatively recently. So um, what we all say is it's not just a good idea. Um, additional support for learning is, um, is, is the law. And you can see the full name of the, the, the legislation there, the uh, Education Additional Support for Learning Scotland Act 2004. We just tend to refer to it as the Additional Support for Learning Act. Um, and it gives pupils the right to extra support if they need it. Um, uh, and that this support should be um, based on, on their, their individual needs. The um, Additional Support for Learning oh, Act sets out local authorities' duties to identify which children and young people in their areas have additional support needs um, and to provide um, adequate and efficient support to those children. They have a duty also to keep that support they're providing under review um, to make sure that it's meeting a, a people's needs um, and also to identify which pupils may need a coordinated support plan. And I'm going to talk about plans in a wee bit more detail um, uh, in a moment. Um, local authorities schools also have a, a duty to take, um, to listen to and take account of the views of pupils parents and carers um, and um, importantly very importantly for families that we know um, uh, local authorities also publish and keep up to date information about the arrangements they have in place to identify and meet people's additional support needs and certainly for the families that we deal with um, it is really helpful to be able to um, find the local information that local authorities have and be able to share that it's, it's often the way to to help them understand how it's 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 provided in the local, their local authority area um, also we all often talk to parents about the fact that it's helpful to find out a local authorities uh, or a school policy if they're about to talk to the school about um, a child's additional support needs. So having this information and it being up to date um, is hugely important. Um, also, local authorities should also have arrangements in place to resolve disagreements with parents and carers about additional support needs. Um, and there's various um, uh, services available that can support um, more formally uh, any um, disputes between parents and, um, uh, and carers and schools and local authorities and we've got lots and lots of information about that uh, on our website. We have a fact sheet about dispute resolution um, and resolving disagreements so it's definitely worth having a look at those if you if you would like more information about that. Unfortunately I didn't have time in this thought to be able to talk about that in detail. Um, so that's the sort of local authorities um, uh, uh, responsibilities. Um, it's worth talking specifically um, under the Additional Support for Learning Act, parents and carers have certain rights themselves. Um, 
and it's worth knowing also that the definition of a parent in education law includes anyone who has parental responsibilities and um, guardianship or, or care of a young person um, or a child. Uh, and this means that these rights do apply to uh, kinship carers and to foster carers um, as well. And certainly we've done a lot of work recently with fostering network uh, in Scotland and um, we're very aware that um, a lot of first families aren't aware of their rights. So if you are working with families, uh, I think this is really important information to share. So parents and carers obviously have uh, lots of sort of expert knowledge about their child um, and should be involved in decisions and discussions about their additional support for, for learning. Um, there are particular rights under the ASL Act um, that parents and carers also have. So they have a view, um, sorry, have a right to share their views about their child's supports and have those uh, views taken into account uh, when decisions are being made. Um, parents and carers also have the right to have a supporter or advocate present at any meetings about their child support and for families that's quite an important one. We hear a lot of time from families where um, actually uh, attending meetings and, and um, uh, working with the school can, can be quite overwhelming. So having somebody along with them can really help. And that's one of their rights under this legislation. Um, parents also have the right to ask for an assessment if they think their child's needs have not been identified or that their child's needs have changed. Um, and they can also ask for a specific type of assessment. Um, so for example, an educational psychology or mental health um, assessment if they feel that is what's needed. And we've got um, a huge amount of information on our website and in our fact sheet about how parents and carers should ask for an assessment. Um, and that also just explains how assessments are carried out um, and um, what they can expect from an assessment as well. Um, Parents and carers um, also have a, a right to ask for their child to be um, assessed for a coordinated support plan. Um, if that's not been done or if a child's circumstances or, or, or health or um, situation has changed. Um, and as I said, I'll talk a little bit more about planning uh, a couple of slides um, from now. Um, so local authorities must seek and take account of parents and carers views and any information that they provide um, either when assessing a child's needs or if they need to see SP. And again from the helpline um, calls that we get and the inquiries that we get it can be really helpful for parents and carers to understand that these are rights and that they have um, a, a, a right to be involved and to be listened to. And a lot of what we do uh, with the Inquire Helpline is just help families do that in a productive way. So help them um, think about what they want to raise with the school and a productive way um, to do that so that the child um, in question gets the support they need. And again, I'll talk a little bit more about working with, with the school later. So on to children's rights, um, obviously Scottish education is based on the belief that education is a human right and that all children and young people should be supported to reach their full potential. Um, and children's rights and entitlements are absolutely fundamental to that in Scotland. And so the legislative, the word I never get right the first time, legislative framework, um, including the Additional Support for Learning Act, um, really supports this and will be further strengthened um, through the incorporation of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, the UNCRC. Um, and that's due to be incorporated into Scots Scottish law very soon. Um, and there's, lot, there's more information about this and what this means on our helpline. And we're also doing a lot more work on that at the moment. So there'll be more information about that available soon. Um, so, under additional support for learning law, children have the rights to adequate support to meet their individual needs and, and that this um, support helps them reach their fullest potential. And in 2018, a change in the law um, gave children aged 12 to 15 very specific rights, um, which are very similar to the parents and carers right I spoke about earlier. Um, and they also put in place um, access to support to help children access their rights. And that's a service called My Rights, My Say. 
um, and it provides a number um, of supports. It provides advocacy to children who do want to use their rights um, to have more of a say or have a say in decisions that are being made in their um, education and support. Um, and there's lots of information about how that service <coughs> can actually help children um, be involved uh, and, and, as I said, have a say in their support. Um, that's the website address there um, and as I said lots more information uh, on there and I'm happy to talk about that a wee bit more if needed. Um, I've also included there our website for our children and young people um, called REACH and that's got lots of information aimed at children and young people which explains what this means. So what does um, uh, being involved in decisions mean, what's the child's plan, uh, all of those things. So it really does um, break that down and, and make it um, children and young people friendly. So I wanted to talk briefly about um, planning um, children's support. So obviously once the school and nursery or local authority have found out that a child needs additional support, um, they should consider how that will be delivered. Um, and planning is obviously an ongoing process um, involving different types of plans depending on a child's needs. Uh, but all children will have a um, personal learning plan. But if a child needs um, one or two minor changes to the support they receive at school or at nursery, uh, they may need a written plan. Um, and sometimes this is done um, verbally at meetings. So um, if you're meeting with the school about a child, um, who needs a bit additional support, it can be agreed that that support will be put in place uh, and you can um, review that and uh, keep up to date on how that's working, either verbally or at meetings. And the action that comes out of that may be written in an email or it may just be a verbal agreement. And that's absolutely fine if that if that's working and uh, the support is, is, is in place and is working for that child. Um, but for some children who may need more support um, or have additional support needs that need that little bit of extra planning, they may have um, or need a, a learning support plan. And these are called different things in different areas. So individual educational um, plan or additional support plan. And what this plan um, should do is set out um, a child's needs and the support that will be put in place to meet their needs. And it should inc include short term goals and for what that support is for and who's responsible for providing it. Um, and schools should work with parents and children um, uh, where appropriate um, and other professionals to create a plan and review that regularly. Um, when a child um, needs more significant um, support um, or support from several staff in the school and nursery, as well as from outside of education, they may have a coordinated support plan. And a coordinated support plan um, is a plan that's for pupils with very complex uh, multiple support needs or multiple support needs um, who require that significant support from education and at least one other agency, as I said, and that could be social work or health. And what the CSP aims to do is help all professionals from the different agencies work together to make sure that that pupil has the support they need with their learning. And the difference with the coordinated support plan compared to other plans is that it's a legal document and local authorities must um, open a CSP for all pupils who meet the criteria for one and provide the support that is detailed in that. Um, and there's also a different, different sorry, route to address if there's any disagreements about a coordinated support plan, either opening one, um, the content of a plan, or um, if uh, the local authority want to close a plan, there's a different route to, to resolving disagreements um, through that, which is the additional support needs tribunal. Um, so that's quite a lot of information for one slide, but we again, we have a planning um, fact sheet, which is available on our website, um, and also um, we have one specifically on coordinated support plans, which explains more about the plans, but also how parents can can ask for one um, and just help also just understand how, how plans are used and what their purpose is. So again, um, lots of information available on that. So I'm um, coming up to a sort of the last few slides and I, and I won't go into this part in, in much detail, but I, I suppose it's just to highlight that a lot of the advice and information we offer in our helpline is not about the legal framework, but ways in which families can work in partnership with schools. 
So what we talk to families about a lot is um, different ways that it can be um, you talking to school about um, a child's needs or support that you think that they need. So um, if these are just examples of that of giving parents confidence that they have a right to be involved and that a lot of the experience and knowledge that parents have around their child's needs is really helpful to the school um, and that it can be really helpful just to provide that information to the school thinking about the child's needs but also their likes their dislikes and their strengths and we've got a really nice infographic that just provides information for families about what they might want to think about sharing and how to do that um, and also just explaining to families that it's, it, uh, you can ask for this information to be shared with teachers um, if your child's happy for that information to be shared and you're happy for that to be shared with all of the people that will be working with with a child. Um, also really importantly, because communication is one of the, I think it's about 30% of our calls um, are about communication with families and schools. So parents can ask the school what's the best way to communicate them, uh, to communicate with them if they need to contact them about something outside of any normal meetings that they're having. We've also got lots of information for families around preparing for meetings. So what can they do in advance? Jot down the issues wanting to cover in a meeting or even emailing the school in advance to say, I know we've got a meeting coming up. Here's a few of the things I'd just like to make sure that we have time to cover for. It's really helpful for families to feel like they've they've got that on the agenda, but also it gives schools time to find out any information that might be helpful for that conversation. Um, Parents can ask for clarification if they don't understand what's being discussed or has been agreed. Sometimes at meetings, a lot of information can be shared or information shared previously has been forgotten. So again, encouraging families just to really ask questions if they have any. And um, we get a lot of families who ask for uh, whether they are not receiving minutes and can they have minutes. And um, when we say just ask the school for that, that's absolutely fine. If there's not minutes taken, it's really OK just to write down what you think are the actions from that meeting and send them into the school afterwards to say, here's what I um, I think came out of that meeting. And that can be really helpful. Again, if, if support isn't put in place or isn't um, uh, working as it should to go be able to, to have a record of what was agreed and what should be there. Um, and also just if you do feel that your child needs a learning plan, parents can ask for, for the school to consider opening one uh, or, the, or the best way to, um, to organise uh, or have, have that in writing. We also say to families it's really helpful to um, just keep records of, of, of meetings and discussions. Um, it's often handy to put things in emails so that people have got a record of that so that they can um, follow up with that if they need to. So I just wanted, because obviously we're doing this in partnership with Call Scotland, I wanted to really super quickly just talk about um, technology. So we worked with Call Scotland, it was brilliant to do this with, with Paul um, from Call, who to just put together some information about um, talking to a child's school about technology to support their learning. We were aware from helpline calls that, um, that families do have a lot of questions around uh, how they can get the right support like like technological support put in place um, and obviously the legislation itself does not set out what type or level of support a child needs and support can obviously take lots of forms from one-to-one -to, -one to a learning program but obviously um, uh, technology is one way that a, a support might be provided so um, example may be that a child um, with dyslexia may use an iPad uh, or a particular program on an iPad to help with their learning and obviously every child is different and will will need different types of support to help them do that um, and obviously um, technology may be a packet uh, one one out of a package of care that uh, or support that a child is getting so we've got some um, tips here and I'm hoping this just works um, it's basically we have a publication called Talking to a Child's School about support and it just explains this, some of the sort of um, uh, legal um, uh, information that's helpful in terms of um, making reasonable adjustments and children having the support they need but it also talks through some um, eight steps about what a parent can do 
if they want to um, talk to the school about the, the use of technology. And it's particularly helpful, I think, if for parents it's often difficult to know what might be available uh, or what might help their children. Um, and also a common question that we get is that, well, a child is given an iPad and, and some programmes to use that's not known about through, through the school, um, or there's not enough training provided about how to use technology. And they were certainly, I think, issues that, that, that Paul, um, who I worked with on this, from Call Scotland recognised as issues as well. So there's some sort of top tips there and also more content, um, sorry, more contacts in terms of getting in touch with Call Scotland if there's any, um, any issues with that. So um, that is available on our website and it can be downloaded uh, and used and handed out to parents um, and carers um, or just, just uh, for schools to have a think about in terms of uh, uh, what that means for, for their school. Um, I also just wanted to chat to you, there's a lot of information, I've covered it quickly, but we do have a parents and carers guide, which takes all of the um, ASL legislation and the code of practice that goes along with it and makes and puts that in one document that's really easy for parents and carers to use. But it's also a really handy document for professionals and it's great. We, we've had people support and um, staff use it as a, as a way of um, uh, learning more about additional support for learning so it's it's a really helpful guide and we've also got 27 um <clears throat> fact sheets that break down more information um from that and i just wanted to highlight that when you go into our um website you can uh, download our guides and fact sheets um, or you can just order free copies and we're happy to send them out to schools to local authorities to parents groups whatever whatever works best so um just to finish and i'm speeding through this now um that's all our information our helpline our website and our email address and i'd just like to highlight reach again because it's a fantastic resource um, and we've got lots of information to help schools champion children's rights, but also for, for children and young people themselves to have a look at. And one of the great things about all of our um, all of our resources is that um, all of our resources are available in um, other languages. We have 102 languages. We have a, a tool on our website called Recite Me, which translates everything into over 102 languages, I think. So it means that if you have got families um, or you're somebody who needs a little bit of extra help with understanding um, additional support for learning, it's all available there. It's it's also got lots of accessibility tools for people who have hearing um, sort of uh, uh, visual impairments so it's available it can be read out and um, so there's lots it's worth checking that out but certainly for families where English is an additional language and um, all of our resources uh, PDFs and website content is available in other languages so I've overrun by six minutes <laughs> <That's> <laughs> so I'm really that's sorry okay. that was very fast no, but um, no, thank you. I hope that's been useful and um, what I would probably just reiterate is that um, we're we're absolutely happy to chat to um, support groups or uh, anything like that if it would be helpful but we've also got lots of resources that we're happy to send out and our resources are all free so um, that's certainly there and look out for our professionals resources in March. Okay so are, you, are you happy to take some questions just now? Yes Kat? absolutely I'm sorry I ran okay. over it. Yeah, yeah no that's okay if you'd like to ask Kat a question you could either just pop your pop your hand up or type something into the message box and uh, we'll see if we can uh, I'll get Kat to answer. I was just going to ask, uh, presumably with so many children in Scotland now having additional support needs, you must get lots of in inquiries. We do. We, we are, a number of inquiries have been going up, um, you know, pretty much every year. What we're trying to do more of, though, is to make sure that um, trying to get more information out to families before it becomes um, problematic. So before there's been any breakdown in relationship with schools or and, and really raise awareness of, of uh, lots of the work that we do is around how to work with with schools uh, to get that support in place um, and then also the steps it can take if that isn't happening. But yeah, we are getting lots more calls. I mean, I think a lot of our calls are about children who are um, who have autism. Um, and we do sadly get quite a few calls from families where children are, are missing out on quite a lot of their education. So again, it's like different ways that we can support families to have those conversations to get the, the support in place so the child can get back to school or if, if needed, go, go, 
go into dispute resolution. Um, one of the things I didn't have a chance to talk to you was around mediation and the fact that that's a service that's available to help that. So again, if people are interested in that, there's information about that on our website. But yeah, that's sadly, great. the numbers are going up. But, yeah. um, um, Paul has asked a question. Um, she's actually popped it into the message box. So I'll just read it out. Does the support extend to early years, all children under five? That's from Paula Dennis. Yes. So I probably should have said that at the start that this applies to children. You know, this is a, um, a nursery or school. It's not just um, um, school age children. It does apply to children who are in early years. And we actually have an early years fact sheet which explains all of this for families. And it's quite a helpful resource as well. If there's families, um, or if you're a, if you're a parent, or if you're working in a nursery, to just help parents understand what this means um, in terms of getting that support and, and again it helps it with steps that families can take to for support to work in in, in nursing yeah okay. uh, Christina's asked a question um, if a parent requests an assessment for example dyslexia is there a time limit on on this so not for assessments and um, what we tend to say around like for exa exam example like assessments of dyslexia like depending on how old the child is some schools may not want to do a, a dyslexia assessment very early because they'll be aware that children develop it in di at different rates and so they may hold off doing an assessment um, or you know maybe p1 to p3 because they're wanting to see how that child develops and how they progress and um, if you want to ask for an assessment you can do that you can put it in writing to the local authority there's not a time scale for that but what we would say to families is if they've asked for an assessment and they haven't had any response to that um then um to just follow up with the school to to to, to, to say an email saying just wondering what's happening with that assessment is that taking place or the other thing to remember about that though is a child doesn't need a uh, a formal diagnosis, so in this case of dyslexia, to um, for support to be put in place. So even if assessment hasn't done, but a child has needs, um, you know, under the ASL legislation, support should be put in place to meet that child's needs, even without that diagnosis. But that's not to say that a diagnosis isn't helpful. It can be incredibly helpful to understand a child's needs and what support might help. But not having one certainly shouldn't. Um, stop support being um, looked at and considered what might help that child either while that's happening or just to meet that child's needs if they're if they're presenting with with yeah. certain I uh, just Catherine's actually making the, the, the point that you know there's no one assessment for dyslexia and you know, if dyslexia is, is identified by the school, but not necessarily diagnosed by the school. Uh, Mrs. Stars has asked a question in the act. Um, is there a difference between a duty and a responsibility of a local authority? Um, so there are there are set um, response there are set responsibilities within the within the legislation, um, and I mentioned those for local authorities um, at the beginning. What there is though is a code of practice. Uh, which supports the legislation, which sets out the expectations on schools and local authorities. So what you can see from there is what's expected of schools under the uh, Additional Support for Learning Act. So it's got um, guidance around. So some of them are absolutely duties and they have to be done, whereas other ones, it's like there is guidance on what schools should be doing. So the code of practice is very helpful for you know, as a as a uh, as a as a document to look at if if you're working in schools. And what we've done with the parents' guide is taken that code of practice and made that into a document that parents can understand. So I'm not quite sure if that's coming from a teacher or a parent, but um, yeah, that that one works. Uh, that that can be helpful. So yeah, some of them are duties. And if you, for example, go into our parents' guide, the the duties are at the end of each section. There's there's a duties. What has to be done. Um, is set out clearly in that. Thank you. Uh, one last question from Helen. Um, are you involved with any e e e English as additional language families uh, at this time? And if so, what are some of the common issues that they raise regarding the children's needs? So this is a really interesting question, actually, and it's quite timely because what we've been doing a lot of work on is trying to make the information and advice that we have more accessible to families. And I think what is a bit unknown is that um, that, that if a child has additional support needs resulting as 
because of English as an additional language, obviously the rights apply to them, they would have the same rights. But it's also raising awareness with families of that. So what we do is, uh, the way that we do that is we have um, a language line on our helpline, for example. So if families are wanting to talk to us in English, is um, difficult for them, they can use the language line. And as I mentioned, all of our um, resources are now available in lots of different languages. So that's how we're trying to ensure that that families are aware that they have rights, they, they may have these rights, their children might need support. But what we also do is a lot of partnership work with organisations who support families, because that's another way to share information um, with families, is to provide the people who are already supporting them with information. So if education is an issue, then um, the, you know there, there, there's signposting going on there, or they themselves can use um, our resources to help the family. So we just recently run an advisors um, set webinar to help people who routinely work with families to understand the rights more so that they can share it with families. And I think there's lots more work we could do around this, absolutely, to ensure that we're working with a, a, a really wide range of families. And I think definitely um, we are just about to do some more work on that in terms of the helpline specifically. Um, so in terms of the issues, I think it can be, uh, there's lots of issues um, that we hear about, but in terms of the families we hear about, it's often a very, it's very similar to what we hear about um, from the, the rest of the families we talk to. So it can be around advice and information, finding out about their children's rights, about support, about assessment um, and about um, transitions are often major issues um, and also um, uh, uh, communication with schools, so just getting the right information and having those conversations. So I don't have figures off the top of my head, but I'm aware that the issues are, are often very similar to what we hear about in the general population. 